Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's 12 o'clock now, according to my uh, clock. So really good afternoon to everyone. And welcome to this special policy talk. I'm Celeste Watkins Hayes, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy here at the University of Michigan. And I'm founding director of the Center for Racial Justice. And I'm so pleased to welcome the previous Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Ford School, Michael Bar. Welcome home, Michael. As we know, Michael currently serves as the Vice Chair for Supervision of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. In that role, he develops policy recommendations regarding banking supervision and regulation. It's a fitting position as it was created by the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act in which Michael was deeply involved. In addition to this stint in government service, Michael served as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Financial Institutions, as the Treasury Secretary's Special Assistant, as Special Advisor to the President, and as a Special Advisor and Counselor on the Policy Planning Staff at the U.S. Department of State. We thank you all for this work on behalf of all Americans. He was the Ford School Dean for five years and led us through all of the convulsions of adjusting to the COVID-19 pandemic. Initiatives also like the Leadership Initiative and the Center for Racial Justice and the Cone Collaborative uh, uh, program all emerged during his time as Dean. We are stronger than ever, thanks in large part to his focus on community and continuity. Today, he will give us some insight into his public service career, his passion for expanding access to financial institutions for all people, and whatever else he is allowed to speak about during this financial blackout period. After Michael makes some introductory remarks, my colleague, Ford School Professor Josh Hausman, will lead a discussion, and there will be some time for audience Q&A afterwards. So for now, let me hand things over to Josh and to our friend, Michael Barr. Uh, so thank you. It's, a, it's such an honor to be, have the opportunity to speak with you and to be part of welcoming you back to the Ford School. As Dean Watkins Hayes just mentioned, we're in the so-called Federal Reserve blackout period. This is the time around when the Federal Open Market Committee meets, when Fed policy ma makers are asked to avoid external communications related to current policy. So I'll be avoiding any questions about current mo monetary policy. But that'll give us an opportunity to discuss some broader questions related to policymaking, education, and your background. Do you want me to dive in, or do you want to give some remarks? To well, start? I just want to say it's uh, just wonderful to be back here um, in the Ford School with all of you, and uh, really just delighted to be here. One of the great joys I have when I'm in Washington is I often will bump into a Ford School student uh, in the hallway of Congress or in the Federal Reserve Building or at another agency. And uh, having that uh, warm connection is really just terrific. So wonderful to be back. Thank you. Well, I thought I, I'd start by asking you to tell us a little bit about what you do with the Federal Reserve and also a bit about what's distinctive about the Federal Reserve. So as we just heard, you've, you've had a long and distinguished service in government and in many different parts of the government. What, what's different about the Fed? What, what should people here know about the Fed? Well, let me start with your, your question about the role. So I have two jobs right now at the Federal Reserve. I'm a governor of the Federal Reserve, and I'm a, a, the vice chair for supervision at the Federal Reserve. So in the first role as a governor of the Federal Reserve, I sit on the Federal Reserve Board, so there's seven of us, and I sit on the Federal Open Markets Committee along with presidents of the regional Federal Reserve Banks. And in my governor role, I, one of the things that I do is uh, help us to develop and then vote on monetary policy, the setting of interest rates. And really what we're trying to do in that uh, capacity is achieve our dual ma mandate of having uh, stable prices in the economy and maximum employment. So we're really trying to weigh both those goals. And in my role as vice chair of supervision uh, at the Federal Reserve, I'm in charge of overseeing our supervision and regulation of the banking system. Uh, so that involves things like uh, setting capital requirements for banks, supervising banks, trying to ensure the safety of the, of the banking system. The, the Federal Reserve is uh, different from the agencies that I worked in before. I worked before at, at the White House and at, at the Treasury Department, the State Department. 
in that the Federal Reserve is an independent agency. So we conduct our policy separate from the uh, administration, separate from the president. We're setting a policy based on our own judgment about what we think the right thing to do is. And the governors, the, the people who are um, uh, setting those policies, have all been nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate in our roles. Once we're in those roles, we, we act independently. Thank you. And I wonder, from your experience at the Federal Reserve and previously in government, what, what are some lessons that you've learned? If you were to give some advice to students of the audience who might want to go on and have leadership positions in, in policymaking, uh, what, what might be things that maybe they wouldn't be thinking about that, that you think would be useful to think about? Well, look, first of all, the students here are all terrific. And um, <laughs> I know are, are, uh, are doing great work um, in, in your classes and learning the analytic techniques uh, that you need to be successful. Um, one of the things that's really important when you're doing a policymaking job is to really dig down into the details of the work you're doing. We used to have this expression at the, at the Treasury Department when I worked there, what's the ratio of your views to the facts? And if you had a lot of views and you didn't know very many facts, you weren't really especially useful to the conversation. Um, so uh, you want people with good, strong analytic skills and detailed knowledge of, of what they're working on. Um, you, you also want uh, people who can, uh, I'll put it you know, bluntly, who are not jerks. Uh, it, it's, very, it's very easy to go in the first stages of your career. You can kind of make advancement in a way irrespective of your personality traits. But uh, if you really want to make a difference, if you really want to be effective, um, don't, don't be a jerk. Work really well with the people who, you know, who are around you. You have to work really, really hard is another thing I'd say. I mean, it's, it's sort of obvious, but anything worth doing requires a lot of hard work. Uh, and so there's not, there aren't any shortcuts around that. There's not a, a way to, uh, to do it other than doing the, the hard work. Uh, you know, I, I would say, um, you know, look for things that you're passionate about, uh, that you care about, that you want to make a difference on, because there are lots of really difficult problems in the world. You can't work on all of them. Uh, but pick some things that you really feel passionately about, or pick something that you feel really passionately about, and really try and focus on making a difference in that area. There are some things I worked on right now that I've been working on for 30 years. And that kind of ability to keep at a problem year after year, problem after problem, cycle after cycle, I think you can make a difference with that kind of commitment that you can't make if you are trying to think about everything. So th those are just some, some things maybe to, to keep in mind. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and thinking about policy making, I, I think it's easy right now to look at the world and be cynical about the possibility of policy mm -hmm. making the world a better place. Pe people who know me know that I'm, I'm hardly immune to, to cynicism sometimes. <laughs> But of course, in so many ways, the world is a, a much better place than it was 50 or 100 years ago, um, mm -hmm. in, in large part thanks to people like you who've gone into policymaking and, and worked hard to, to push better policies. I'm wondering more generally what you would tell a student who, who feels hopeless about the prospects of policy making the world better. Well, I would say, you know, in my, in my personal experience, I have seen lots of things get better. I've seen some things get worse. I mean, that's just the way it is, but I've seen many things get better over the course of my professional lifetime. And I can see it in the, in the work that I do um, at the Federal Reserve and the work that I've done at, at Treasury and the other agencies that, you know, I think sometimes it's easy to look at government or a large corporation or the nonprofit sector and see some large distant kind of entity. Certainly that, that is the case with how some people think about working in government in Washington. But the government is made up of individual human beings. Your friends and your colleagues, your predecessors here at the Ford School, um, the people who come after you here at the Ford School and at other institutions around the country is made up of individual people. And those individual people make a big difference in the outcomes at, at an agency uh, that you work in. I know, you know, for example, um, 
you know, obviously right now I'm, I'm operating at a level where I'm making decisions, so I'm a policymaker, but, but there are lots of people who I work with at the Federal Reserve who are quite junior in the organization, who are in some cases just starting out uh, at the organization. And I can tell you they make a difference in how I think about a problem because I'm in a meeting with them and they say something smart. They say, well, that's smart, that's useful. I learned something that's going to change the way I think about a problem. So you can make a difference even as a very junior person in the outcome of decision making, even in a very large organization. Thank you. I'm particularly pleased to hear that about people at the Fed because I was a my first real job was as an right. RA at the Fed. So I, I, I I'm dubious that I made all that much of a difference. I know. But, you know but, even, but maybe. I, I'll tell you even you know even the charts we get we get chart packs all the time. Yeah, so I, chart I, pack I, I made those charts. The RAs the RAs make the chart packs. Yes. yes. And, you know, I, I had lunch with the RAs a few times, and, you know, it, it makes a big difference to get a good chart pack, like that you really can understand what's going on in a different way. Or, or you can get a bad chart pack, dare I say, and, and that makes it harder to do your work. <laughs> so it, it matters. Well, I, like, I, I do like to say I, I left the Fed in June 2007, so right mm -hmm. before things, so that, you know, correlation is causality. So I must <laughs> So what are the... Fun things about preparing for this event was with you was that I, I had the chance, I, I read a bunch of your speeches mm. as Fed governor. And one thing I noticed in those is that you often cite academic research. And so this is a, a bit of a selfish question for, for me, but I was wondering, without talking about any specific current policy issue, but mm -hmm. what makes academic research useful for you as a policymaker? And are there things that people like me who are writing papers could do that would make our research more useful to policymakers? Well, there, there's all different kinds of academic research, you know, first of all. And, and so a wide variety of different kinds of research can be helpful to us as policymakers. You know, sometimes I'm citing academic research or I'm reading academic research because I'm not sure how to think about a problem. And the research can help me frame a question in a new way or think about a problem in a new way. Uh, sometimes I'm looking to academic research because we're, we're making very difficult decisions all the time. And it helps to be as grounded as you can in the empirical research, whether that's qualitative empirical research or quantitative empirical research. That empirical research gets you further down the road. All the decisions we make as policymakers are probabilistic decisions that involve a large amount of uncertainty about the future path, whether that's on monetary policy or on uh, financial stability policy, on bank regulation, evolution of the payment system, all the work that the Fed does. We're making a set of judgments that are future-oriented, and we, there's not, there aren't very many good papers about the future. <laughs> but, but there are lots of good papers that help us interpret empirical evidence in a way that helps us make better predictions about the future, makes us make better assessments about um, the probabilistic judgments that we need to make. And so uh, papers can be very helpful for that. You know, there are different, there are different kinds of academic work, work, as I said at the outset, and I wouldn't want, you know, if you're doing a particular kind of academic work, you shouldn't, like, change that to go help a policymaker. Um, because often some really, you know, what I think of as basic R&D work in a field can be absolutely foundational to work that a policymaker does then later. But, but some kinds of uh, research are, lie right at the intersection between that foundational work and what a policymaker is trying to do. And to the extent that, that academics can help translate their work into that realm, that's helpful. You know, in the, in, the, in the science world, there's a kind of a process that goes from kind of bench research to say product development for a cancer drug. And it sort of has a whole set of continuums. There isn't really for a lot of the policy work we do that same established set of pathways between the, the sort of bench research and the solving cancer you know, the, the, the work that a doctor is doing in a doctor's office, equivalent for us. But if academics can, you know, help fill in the gaps along that path, that, that helps us in our work.
No, that, that's helpful. And a follow-up, how do you tend to find the academic research that you do? Is this something? I have good RAs. <laughs> So if it's a, if it's a field I know, I kind of know the sure. I know the field. Yeah. But if it's not a field I know, uh, you know there are one of the things that's really amazing about the Federal Reserve, and and you were part of this is they're just absolutely fabulous staff right. at the federal in the Federal Reserve system, in the Research and Statistics Department, in Monetary Affairs, in Supervision and Regulation, um, in in Payment System and Oversight. So really across and in the Reserve Banks. So. Uh, you know, both in Washington, D.C. And, and in the regional Federal Reserve Banks. And, you know, one of the great things about being in that position is if I have some question, I can ask somebody, and that somebody finds, in some cases, hundreds of people who can work on answering that question for me and tell me what the interesting papers are. And if I'm interested, you know, sometimes I'll organize a private roundtable. I'll have a, a, some academics get together with me and talk about a topic. Um, but mostly I'm reading things. I'm reading summaries of things and, and, and the like. Mm -hmm. So moving on then uh, outside policy a bit, but a, a lovely thing that I remember during the pandemic, and this is a tradition that Dean Watkins Hayes, Watkins -Hayes has continued, were your Sunday evening emails. And so this was a, a really lovely thing to help the community stay connected starting in spring 2020. And you often shared some non-work things in those emails, things about what you were up to, whether it was running in the ARB or listening to Miles Davis or reading Elizabeth Bishop's poetry. I wondered what you're busy with these days outside of work, uh, if you have any time outside of work. Well, I, I always think, I think it is important to have time outside of work no matter what, even if you're incredibly busy. You know, one, one of the reasons I wrote those Sunday night emails, and I, I, I'm glad that, that Dean Watkins Hayes is continuing them, is that, first of all, it helped, it helped me to be connected to all of you. So it was partly a selfish thing I was doing, to, because we were all dispersed. You know, we had no, no notice. We all, the, the, the faculty had to learn how to teach online in 20 minutes, and um, students were all dispersed around. So to stay connected to all of you, I felt important to me, and I was hoping that it helped the community stay connected to each other as well. And you know, one of the reasons that I talked about what I was doing personally is I was trying to, uh, if I could, model a path towards having a um, an existence that was okay, even though we were under that kind of strain and pressure and, um, and difficulty. Um, and, uh, and so, so now I, 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 still do all, I still do lots of the things that, that I was talking about in those emails. I, I try and run um, uh, quite a bit during the week. Um, every day I get up and uh, do something, and often it's running. Um, yeah, I ran this morning in, uh, in the uh, Bandemir and um, around the lake, around Argo. It was just totally beautiful. Um, I do enjoy reading uh, lots of different things. Um, mostly, you know, I do a lot of reading for work that is about work. So I try very much to do things, reading that is completely unrelated um, to work. It helps, I think, have a sense of balance. I just read a, um, uh, a devastating book, you know, uh, Cormac McCarthy. Has written a tree, has written lots of books, but he has a trio of books, and I was reading the last of those called Cities on the Plain, um, and it's one of these books that you want to slow down as you get further because I didn't want to finish the book, so in the last I'm re I you know I read the first hundred pages or something and you know very fast because I was just incredibly gripped by it, and then after that I just I just would I'd only read a couple pages a night because I just didn't want to let go of this book. And it devastated, he's an amazing writer, uh, the book, but his, in his novels, he basically, he sort of asked the question, if I strip everything bare from my character, what kind of person is he after that? And it, it's just a, just a beautiful book. So I just I read that uh, recently, thought, thought it was really extraordinary. Well, thank you for the, yeah. that, that recommendation. A follow-up, what do you miss about living in Ann Arbor? Oh, everything. 
Ann Arbor is a wonderful community. Um, my wife and I still have an apartment here, and, and so she's teaching every fall here. And um, uh, it's just it's a beautiful community. It's got great, great music scene, great restaurant scene. The culture is lovely. Uh, there's, a, I think, a wonderful warmth to the Ann Arbor community that is very palpable um, that, that I really enjoy. Um, it was an absolutely wonderful place to raise my children, and they still are very connected to here. So um, I uh, still very much uh, you know, ha have it with me. Well, that, that's nice to hear. Um, so I don't know if this is a, a related question to what you do outside of work, but this is, this is certainly somewhat a selfish question. But I'd like to know how, how you get so much done. So you've been <laughs> remarkably effective, uh, you know, a, a successful academic as a professor in the law school. You were an amazing dean at the Ford School. Um, you're now an effective policymaker, as you have been in the past. And you've just told us how you also seem to have time to do a lot outside of work. Uh, how do you do that? Do you sleep? <laughs> well, the, I mean, the most important thing, though, is I absolutely 100% do not do it alone. I don't do it alone. You know, you do it, if you want to be effective in the world, you have a team. And I know that's a, you know, a Michigan saying, the team, the team, the team. Um, so it can be maybe uh, cliched, but it's true. So some things that you hear a lot of just are true. You can't do things alone. So I've never, I mean, anything I've done that is of any value, I've done with somebody else or some group of people. Um, and certainly the work that has been most impactful, whether intellectually impactful in terms of my research or impactful in the world, it's been with other people. Um, you know, you can learn a lot from other people. Um, you know, get different perspectives on a set of problems. The, the work that I would say I'm, I'm uh, proudest of as an academic is work that I did with a psychologist and an economist. Um, together, we did some joint papers in the mid-2000s on behaviorally informed financial regulation. Mm. And, you know, we changed the way each of us thought about a problem. What an amazing gift to be able to do that with a colleague. Um, uh, and similarly, you know, the work I did here at the Ford School, I mean, it was with the faculty and the senior team, senior staff, not, not by myself, by any, by any remote stretch. Um, and now at the Federal Reserve, I have a terrific team of people who I'm working with um, who, uh, you know, when, we're, when we get stuff done, it's because we're really gelling, we're, getting, we're, we're working together, we're building on each other, we're using each other's talents and skills to to make progress. Um, so I'd say the most important thing about getting stuff done is to you know, build a team and work with your team to get to the next level of things you want to do. And, and how do you build that team? So there's, there's maybe some positions where some of that is, is maybe in some ways built in a little bit. But mm -hmm. there's other, you know, if you're a student or starting out as an assistant professor. Yeah. Any advice on how, how to go about building that team? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a great question. I mean, it, I, first I'd say, you know, be open. Um, now, you can't be only open. You also have to have your own ideas and your own vision and your own expertise and your own analytic chops, the things you're bringing to the table. So, but you need to be open. So having that combination of openness and... Um, skill or knowledge is, I think, a very powerful kind of combination. And I think sometimes the tendency is, particularly when you're starting out, if you're an assistant professor um, or maybe when you're a student, the, the, idea, the, the um, impetus and the incentives are to prove your individual value. I, I need to write solo authored papers. I need to show the professor that I'm the smartest in the room. Um, so that's real. I don't want to downplay that. But while you're doing that, you also need to think, OK, what can I learn from my peer? What can I learn from my fellow student? Um, what can I learn from my colleague? I just read a paper. I'm going to call that person and see if they're interested in going out for coffee. Or that student said something really interesting in class that made me think differently. I'm going to go invite them out for coffee and, and talk about it. And 
let's see, you know, if you can um, make progress. I'll say, you know, I mentioned, so this work I was doing with Sendel Malanathan and Eldar Shafir, myself, uh, on this behaviorally informed regulation, we met at a conference, uh, and we liked each other. We went out for coffee. We did the equivalent of going out for coffee for about two years talking about the project before we started writing a word. And then once we started writing, we had a lot to say. <laughs> so, you know, taking the time really to get to know somebody, to develop a sense of connection with them, to get an outside perspective on a problem that you're working on, to get outside of your own, you know, get out of your own way and make those kinds of connections, I think, is really critical. Even early in your career, even as an assistant professor, even as a student, developing that habit of collaboration, I think, is really, is really quite, quite important. And, and what about as more of a, a manager, where a lot of your mm -hmm. team may be, in some ways, sort of working for you? I, yeah. I imagine there's different, sort of more complicated elements there, of sort of yeah. how to be a good manager and have these people be part of a team where you're working together. And mm -hmm. Any advice for people who, who may be in that position in, in the future? Yeah, I mean, I'd say I learned a lot from working with people along the, along the way that I try and bring to bear in the work that I'm doing now. So, uh, you know, early on, for example, when I worked for Bob Rubin at the Treasury Department, he was the Treasury Secretary, I was his special assistant. And one of the things I saw early on, I, you know, that, that he didn't comment on, but I just could see, is we'd, we'd have in a meeting, and he didn't have just the top people in the Treasury Department in a meeting. He had the people who were closer to the problem, the RA even, or the junior person in the room. And he would ask them questions and engage them and cared what they thought about the issue. Now, they didn't have the same necessarily judgment or context that more senior people had. But they had a lot of knowledge and analytic chops and sometimes a new way of thinking about a problem. So I've always tried in my career since then to make sure that you're on a very open, intellectually open process with a very kind of flat management rather than a hierarchical management um, style. So I think that's, you know, that's one, you know, one approach I would, um, I would say. Um, you know, when, you, when you're in jobs like mine, things go wrong all the time. <laughs> and so one important management skill is to know that those things that go wrong are your fault. They're not somebody on your team's fault. Your team is giving you the best inputs they can, and it's your responsibility. So, you know, having the ability to not point fingers at other people and to point them at yourself and understand that you're accountable and responsible, I think, is an important part of being a manager in a very, you know, big, mm -hmm. complex um, organization. Uh, you know, in the in the in the environment, and I'm working with lots of people. I think most of them are absolutely fantastic. But even within that, you know, there are people who have different skills and different abilities, and different strengths and different weaknesses. So one of the things you need to do as a manager is to understand what people's strengths and weaknesses, their relative skills are, and to put the people in situations where you are um, giving them the opportunity to shine on the things that they're best at doing um, and to develop those skills as best, as best they can. So I think that's another, you know, another important um, area. I'd say you know, more, more broadly it's important as a manager that your team have a, a shared sense of mission um, to understand why we're doing the work together. Because I started out, remember, a while ago saying that everything's really, really hard and you have to work really hard. So you don't want to work really hard for something that you're, where you're not share, having a shared mission, a shared set of goals. So making sure that you convey, you communicate to the team of people you're working with that there is a shared mission and that they're part they're not only a part, but they're an important part of achieving the goals of that shared mission. And 
uh, so helping bring people into a sense that we're all in this together, I think, is you know is is another uh, important attribute of that. Thank you. So soon we'll open it up to some audience questions. But first, a, a, a final question from from me. The New York Times columnist and podcast host Ezra Klein, he always ends by asking his guests to give three book recommendations. Oh. Uh, you already gave us one, mm -hmm. but uh, do you have two others for us? Nonfiction, fiction, some things that uh, sure. we, we all ought to be reading, either to understand the world or, or, or for fun? Um, well, I, I, I've been reading a lot of biography over the last couple of years. Um, and one biography that I really liked that I didn't know whether I would like or not in advance um, was a uh, Chernos biography of Grant, President Grant. I've read that. I like Have that. Have you read that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just found it fascinating because here's a, these, a President Grant is a very, I'd say, underappreciated um, president. And he had lots of things he did wrong. So don't, don't get me, you know, um, uh, I'm not endorsing Grant's, all Grant's positions as president. But, but what a fascinating character and what an interesting and I think underappreciated character. And, um, uh, you know, somebody who really came up from absolutely nothing, uh, deep poverty and um, real uh, deprivation to not only uh, lead us through the Civil War, but then to be quite a consequential president uh, after that. And so I, I find reading biography really interesting. It, it, um, this might sound a little backwards, but, uh, but bear with me for a bit. I, I think it actually gives us a better sense of contingency. So, you know, even though we're, we're looking at history, we're looking at a, an individual person's role in history, you get this sense of how things could have worked out differently, how they, how they did work out, but how they could have worked out differently over time. And, and going back to my point about individuals making a difference, that actually, you know, individuals make a difference. And you can actually change structures and move things in a way that, that matters. And um, so anyway, Grant, uh, Grant's biography would be another uh, another. He, he also provides a lesson in financial regulation because he, he, he loses all his money in a, is it a sort he of got Ponzi swindled. scheme. Yeah. He got, he got so swindled. If there had been a, yeah. a better regulator on the job, then. It, it might have helped him out. But then he wouldn't have had to write his memoirs, which are fantastic, <laughs> which he, he memoir, wrote, so it, yeah. it, it would have been sort of a shame. He but. needed, so the story is he had to write his memoirs because he was destitute, literally destitute, and his family had no money to live on, and his um, his widow, who, uh, who outlived him, had no, would have had no money at all. And he was on his, really, his last uh, uh, breaths of life, sitting on his front porch, trying to finish his, by handwriting, finish his memoirs so that his wife would have money to eat. Yeah, it's just, he, he's in agony from, like, throat cancer. Exactly. Um, yeah. And writing his memoirs. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so an, another book? Oh, three. <laughs> I just read. A I, I couple don't mean of, to put you on this. No, spot. no, no. I just I read I read a um, uh, uh, couple of um, books by James McBride that I really enjoyed. The Heaven and Earth Cafe, Heaven Earth Cafe, I think is what it's called, uh, and um, Deacon King Kong, uh, back to back. And he's also a wonderful, playful writer. Um, really, uh, is a writer about. Um, kind of very local culture. What does it mean to have a culture? How do people connect to each other? What is the meaning of humanity in that very local culture? And these two stories are about two very, very different communities that he has built in his, um, in his novels. And they're, they're lovely. Well, thank you. So I think at that point, we, we have a, a little more time. And it'd be lovely to get some questions from the audience. I gather that. Uh... Wait, we have a microphone here, so. Is it on? Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on what you thought, what you think is the most effective way the Fed is able to communicate its monetary policy. Because as you've seen um, since COVID, it's kind of shifted. The FOMC statements, they don't um, change too much each meeting to meeting. And I just want uh, to get your thoughts on like how the Fed's best able to communicate and sometimes like how that's misinterpreted by the markets. 
Yeah, I'm going to be uh, maybe a little briefer than I otherwise normally would be because uh, the period of time after our FOMC decision, we have a, a period of time well before it and a little bit after it where we don't, as individuals, comment at all on monetary policy. So I'm going to just say uh, in, a, in a maybe a narrower way than I otherwise would. So as you said, we have um, – statements we, as a committee, issue after each uh, Federal Open Markets Committee, Interest Rate Setting Committee meeting. And in addition to that, uh, the chairman of the committee, Chair Powell, Jay Powell, uh, gives a press conference after each FOMC meeting. And in that press conference, he has an opportunity to also make a longer statement and then uh, to answer questions from a wide range of reporters. And they grill him, I think, pretty effectively on, on monetary policy. So those, those are opportunities at a regular cadence to, uh, to try and explain as best we can to the public what we're trying to do, which is to achieve these dual uh, mandate objectives Congress has set out for us to try and keep prices stable and to try and keep employment at its maximum level. And we, we try to do both of those goals to the best of our ability using the, the pretty limited tool we have, um, which is uh, setting interest rate policy. Uh, so that, that's our basic, our basic technique. Now, in addition to that, after the blackout period, so like tomorrow I'll be giving a talk, and I can talk about whatever I want to talk about. Um, and policymakers also individually, the chair and the presidents of the regional reserve banks, and individual governors will also, over the course of the year, give speeches where we try and explain as best we can how, we, how we're thinking individually about, about the economy. Now, one, one thing that sometimes is confusing about that second set of things is when we make a decision together, we're making a decision about what to do at that meeting and about interest rates at that meeting. And what we're saying outside of that meeting individually are just our individual views. And sometimes people get confused. They say, why aren't we all saying the same thing? And the answer is we, we each have our own view that we bring to the discussion about what is happening in the economy and what the appropriate path of monetary policy should be. And, and that's appropriate. And so people can then see and make judgments about, well, I, I think you know, this approach makes more sense or this approach seems to be what more people think than fewer people think. It's a way of having additional transparency about the decision-making process. Then in addition to all those things, after the fact, a couple things happen that also help with communication. One is a few weeks after each meeting, there are produced official minutes of the meeting. And people can read those minutes and say, okay, well, Here's more detail about what kind of conversation happened uh, at that meeting. And then five years after the fact, the full transcript of the meeting is produced. So you can see what each of us said in those meetings. And historians like Josh can <laughs> then, economic historians, can then go back and look at those transcripts and say, you know, with a, a fuller sense what the committee thought it was doing and how that related to what people later thought was happening in the economy. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, uh, my name is Eric. I'm a junior BA. Thank you. Well, let me, let me start with the last bit of your question and then work backwards. So um, we don't view our jobs as trying to change um, consumer sentiment. Our, our job is complicated enough just doing the things Congress asked us to do, which is 
to try and achieve price stability and maximum employment. So that is, those are our goals, and we don't focus on other goals other than that. Uh, just don't, don't um, we don't think of that as our objective. But we do, of course, take into account consumer sentiment in understanding what's going on in the economy. And so, for example, if consumers have lower sentiment, all things being equal, they might spend less money than they otherwise would, and that would have an effect on demand, and therefore we, and we think about that in terms of how we think about what's going on in the economy. But we also look at what consumers actually do. So if consumers say they have low sentiment, but then spend a lot of money, then we discount the consumer sentiment part of what, what signals we're getting in the economy and put more weight on what consumers are doing in terms of their spending. So the, those things um, you know, are related to our goal, but they're, they're definitely not our goal to, to achieve. Now with the mic that works. Thank you. Professor Barra, uh, my name is Jorge. I am a second year MPP student. Uh, I work at the Central Bank of Peru. Uh, I have two questions about uh, financial inclusion first. What is the role of the central banks in the promotion of the financial inclusion in the world? And my second question is, what's your opinion about the future of the emissions of the central bank digital currencies? Uh, both uh, really good questions. So um, first on financial inclusion, uh, we, we do think at the Federal Reserve that financial inclusion is part of the work <coughs> that we do in uh, the basic missions of, of the institution. So one of our, our core missions is community development uh, and financial inclusion. It's not part of our monetary policy mission, but it is, a, it is part of our supervisory and regulatory mission. And we take that very seriously. We just did uh, a project, for example, with the other bank agencies, with the FDIC and the OCC, to update our rules under the Community Reinvestment Act which is a rule that was passed in 1977 to encourage banks to meet the needs for financial services in low and moderate income communities in the United States. And we went through a process with the other agency to update our rules to try and strengthen them, to take into account changes that had happened in the banking sector, uh, mobile banking, the rise of technology, uh, the rise of um, banks that operate without branches, and uh, generally trying to make sure that banks are better serving the needs of low and moderate income Americans. So that very much is part of the Federal Reserve's mission. Um, and we have uh, tools we use to try and to foster that. Your, your second question is about central bank digital currency. There are lots of banks all over the world who are at different stages of thinking about or developing central bank uh, digital currencies. Um, at the Federal Reserve, we're doing what I would call bench research on CBDCs. So we have people at the Federal Reserve who are thinking about uh, the policy trade-offs involved. We have people who are thinking about and working on, um, you know, what kind of code would be required to run a central bank digital currency. What are the privacy issues that might arise, and how, what are the different options for resolving those kinds of privacy issues? Um, how do we think about security? What are the different functions that people might want a central bank digital currency to play? That is, is there a useful purpose to have a central bank digital currency? Um, for us at the Federal Reserve, we've said the work that we're doing in this space would only be done, um, would only result in um, a central bank digital currency happening in the United States if Congress authorized us and the President authorized us to offer a central bank digital currency. So we're, we're doing work to understand the issues, but we believe it's up to the elected branches of government to say whether or not we should have a central bank digital currency. We would not, we're not even remotely thinking about just saying we think it's a good idea and therefore we're going to do it. We're not even sure whether we would recommend doing it. And if we recommended it, Congress and the President would need to authorize the issuance of a central bank digital currency. 
And I should also say in the U.S. context, we're thinking about what people call an intermediated central bank digital currency or wholesale currencies. We're not even doing research on or thinking about the idea of the Federal Reserve directly offering a central bank digital currency directly to the public. So we would be doing it if Congress authorized it to the banking system or not at all at a retail level, just at a wholesale level and an interbank level. Those are the kinds of research questions we're, we're grappling with. But we're not, unlike some other countries, we're not close to being able to recommend to Congress or the President whether or not it would make sense. Thank you. Uh, Professor Baer, uh, my name is Rivki. Uh, I am second year MPP student. Uh, same with Jorge, I am also from Central Bank, but I'm from Central Bank of Indonesia. Uh, thank you so much for coming and sharing your amazing story. Actually, I have two questions. First, uh, what's your view about AI in economic policy making, especially in monetary policy making? For example, can we utilize AI to decide the interest rate or something? Uh, second question is what Central Bank can do to promote a green economy? Thank to you so much. Green economy. Uh -huh. Thank you. Right, let, me, let me talk about um, uh, artificial intelligence first. So, you know, first of all, artif artificial intelligence has been around for many, many decades um, in use in lots of different formats. What people are pretty focused on over really just the last year is uh, generative AI, and particularly a form of generative AI that uses uh, large language models for processing. And there are a bunch of innovations that have happened in this space really in the last you know, year and a half that um, have, have caused people to think a little bit differently about this phase. One of them is that uh, these generative AI models are being trained on very, very large data sets. Um, the second is that uh, the... Um, the generative AI models have recently, really a, a year ago, November, um, been introduced widely to the public. And the public's adoption of generative AI was through the charts, I mean, through the roof, off the charts, through the roof, <laughs> get my metaphors correct. Um, and so that kind of rapid adaption, much faster than, you know, than smartphones, uh, a heck of a lot faster than the steam engine. Um, really you know, indicates the power that generative AI might have in the future to, to change the way we think about the economy. And in the short term, generative AI is being used to do things that are, to be honest, not that interesting. Uh, so in the short term, we're getting more efficient sales techniques or more efficient writing of press releases um, or um, uh, uh, other kinds of what I would describe as pretty basic level efficiencies. And those, those are good, but they're not, that, they're not super interesting. Um, the, the question is, in the longer term, so you know, not this month or in six months, but in two years or in 10 years, how transformative can generative AI be? And you know, people are uh, pretty bullish about the possibility that it could improve productivity um, over time, and that might have implications for how we think about the economy. Um, and uh, it might change jobs in ways that we don't know. So people are trying to figure out what tasks, you know, jobs are, you can think of jobs as a bundle of tasks. What tasks within what jobs are amenable to efficiency improvements or advancements through generative AI? If there are enough of the bundle of a job, maybe a job disappears and is replaced with a generative AI. Or it might be that if it's part of somebody's job, then generative AI is making them more efficient um, with respect to a particular task. So, so for example, coders are finding generative AI very useful in doing the first part of some project that's making coding more efficient already right now. Uh, so you know, we're looking at you know, efficiency gains, productivity gains. It could be that uh, generative AI um, could substantially enhance productivity because it's the kind of um, technique that uh, people think of as a general purpose technology. 
it, it can be diffused widely in society and uh, can improve basic uh, R&D in society. And in the case of generative AI, generative AI is improving its own R&D. Uh, and so it is also rapidly progressing, um, much, much more rapidly than other R&D cycles that we've seen. So it could have important productivity effects. We, of course, care about that over the long term in thinking about um, the shape of, of, of society. Now, a question within that is, are there parts of generative AI that can be used uh, within policymaking? Uh, itself, and the answer is we don't, we don't know. We're being um, very careful and cautious about use of it within the Federal Reserve System. We have very um, clear guardrails and rules about what people are allowed to do and not allowed to do. And you can think of it as a sandbox where, in very small ways, we have people who are looking at, in a very careful, closed environment, how it might be, uh, how it might be used. You, you could imagine, for example, that it might, o over the long term, um, help us with our predictive techniques um, in, say, uh, uh, financial supervision. Uh, it's not something we're doing now, but you can think about it over the long term. Over the short term, it might help us with things like I was talking about before that are not that interesting but take a lot of time, like um, you know, uh, processing lots of comments we get and understanding them. Um, again, we're, we're doing these only in very controlled, very small ways uh, now to begin to see uh, how, it, uh, how it might be useful. Um, in terms of the green economy, let me you know, go back to my prior statement. Is we, we have very circumscribed goals um, that Congress um, sets out for us. So Congress has not asked us to have a goal with respect to the green economy. So we're, we're not climate policymakers as a result of, of, of that mission. We do, of course, take into account climate change as it relates to our core emissions. So, for example, in banking supervision, um, we know that financial um, uh, concerns might occur because of climate change. Uh, climate change is changing the relationships in the economy. And so we want to make sure that banks are ready for those kinds of changes. So we supervise banks for safety and soundness. And one of the things that we ask banks to do is to be prepared to understand and manage the risks associated with climate change. So we did two things this last year um, in this regard. One of them is that we issued climate guidance to large banks in the US, banks over $100 billion. And we went through a set of basic risk management and risk measurement practices that they already exercise with respect to other types of risks. And we said, be sure that you're thinking about climate risks with these basic risk tools in mind. And the, the second thing we did is for just a handful of banks, um, uh, six of the eight what are called GSIBs, globally systemically important banks, we worked through with them something called a climate scenario analysis. We said, in the future, um, imagine that you face these types of risks from climate change. How would you manage those risks and measure those risks on your balance sheet? What do you know about how you are able to do that? Are you able to track, <coughs> for example, insurance coverage changes on the properties that you've lent against? It would be a very particular example and understand how the insurance coverage relates to potential losses under a hypothetical scenario where you know, an extreme weather event happens against this kind of backdrop. And so that's another technique we use. But it, it's within a, it's, these are, this is important work, but it is narrow work. It really is focused on the existing mission we have. The one I was talking about is the safety and soundness of the banking system sort of bread and butter issues that we want banks to make sure they're attentive to. I think we're almost out of time. Maybe one more quick question. Hi, Dean Barr. Uh, I'm Alhan. I'm a third year dual MPP MBA student. I just had a follow up to what you just said about scenario uh, testing, but in a different uh, case. So we know that 2024 is going to be a very crucial year with regards to the election. Uh, and 
is also very crucial because of some of the global conflicts taking place right now. And I was just wondering if the Fed considers some uh, aspect, some of these aspects in its forward-looking policy making with regards to what would be best for U.S. economic interests or um, global economic interests in some uh, contexts. Well, let me just say really clear that we do not take politics or the election into account at all in our decision making. Um, our decision making is hard enough uh, as it is with the goals Congress has set out for us. And so we stick very narrowly, uh, very much to that economic mission and, and don't, don't take that into account at all. Now, on, on geopolitical risks that you were talking about, of course, um, those can have important implications for the economy. You know, Russia's war in Ukraine had a significant impact on the global economy, on global supply chains, on inflation. And so we, of course, take into account how the geopolitical realm might affect the economy. And when we're looking at the economy, think about the risks that that, that might pose to our inflation and our employment mandates. Well, I think we need to stop then. I'm actually supposed to teach in this room. In, in, in <laughs> we'll have minutes. to clear out. <laughs> so, <laughs> although that this would be a much better macro class than what I'll be teaching. But <laughs> in any case, uh, thank you so much. This was My just pleasure, fantastic. Josh. And uh, let, let's all.